Well, good afternoon and welcome to another Nevada Historical Society presentation about Nevada and Reno's history. My name is Carol Coleman and I've been a Historical Society volunteer since 19, no, no, 2002, not 1902. In this time when you and our country are so affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, we're collecting stories of your experiences, thoughts, and difficulties. I'll tell you how to participate after this presentation. Today's presentation is based on the Arcadia Early Reno book that I wrote back in 2010 for the Historical Society. And our presenter is Linda Burke. She's a longtime docent volunteer who enjoys giving gallery tours and in-school presentations on Nevada's history. She taught at schools and colleges before moving from Australia. She taught at Our Lady of Snow School for 10 years. She's traveled extensively and now she's enjoying her twin grandchildren. <laughs> now I'm pleased to introduce our presenter, Linda Burke. Thank you, Carol. Thank you very much. Today I'm going to present to you a little bit of early Reno. And as Carol mentioned, this is our book here that was published by the Dozen Council. And on the cover here, this book is available for sale. And most of the pictures that we'll be showing, sharing will have come from this book. The, the book is available for sale and copies also are also available from the Washoe County Library. You can go online and put the book on hold and pick it up. Uh, the title cover is actually of the first arch at Virginia and Commercial Row, erected in 1926 to celebrate the completion of the Lincoln and Victory Highway, Highways with Reno's 1927 Trans Transcontinental Highway Exposition. Following the exposition, the Reno City Council decided to keep the arch, held a contest to name a slogan, which was added in 1929. And the rest is history. Obviously, you know that our arch is very popular and we've had three since. The seal is the Nevada Historical Society seal and it represents the muse of history, Cleo, with a, who bears a, a laurel wreath on her head and a book or manuscript in her hand and a pen too, plus a nod to our Native Americans and our early pioneers, the sagebrush and the Sierra. It was originally designed by Arthur Buell from Tonopah in 1909, which is significant as I'll tell you about that later. Tonopah and Goldfield were very prominent towns in the early part of the 20th century. The largest town, in fact, in the west of the United States was Goldfield outside of San Francisco at that time. Um, and it was updated, our seal, in 2012. Some of you may have seen a previous one uh, on our site here, but this is the latest one, updated in 2012. Now, I want you to look at these dates. When we're looking at American history, 1776, we're all familiar with the Revolutionary War, 1861, the Civil War, 1941, the beginning of the Second World War. Now put these into Nevada's history and we have several important dates. 1859 was the rush to Washoe. 1861, we have the Civil War, but it was also a date when we were, when Nevada became a territory. In 1862, we had Congress and the Trans Act that made the Transcontinental Railroad passed here. Then we had 1864 when Nevada was made a state and 1868 when the Reno was established as a railroad town. You might want to add to that too that in 1864 when Nevada became a state, it, the, the, it was made a state and um, as part of that, the longest and most expensive telegram was ever sent. In 1861, the country was officially at war. The Northern states versus the Southern states over the right to slavery and its use in the Southern economy. The South wanted to secede from the Union to maintain their right to slavery. At the end of the war, Congress passed the 13th Amendment to abolish slavery. A two third majority of the states in the Union needed to ratify the 13th Amendment within their state. Prior to 
Reno becoming a town, Nevada first became a territory, separated from the Utah Territory in 1861 and then a state in 1864. It is believed Nevada became a state so quickly because Lincoln needed its vote for ratification of the 13th Amendment. And you can see here the bits that were added on to Nevada from the Utah Territory and the southern areas here from Arizona. There were quarrels for a long time, for quite a few decades, over the California border with Nevada. And how do you think people communicated at that time? The Pony Express began its mail service in April 1860 between St. Joseph and San Francisco. And the last one was in November 1861. The first telegraph, uh, the first telegraph arrived on the Comstock in 1861. And the first telephone was in the Pounding District in the, 90, in the 1880s. Took quite a long time. The Grosch brothers discovered silver on Mount Davidson. At that time, claims had to be filed in Placerville, California, requiring a trip across the Sierra. The brothers died before they could file a claim. When Henry Comstock filed for their claim, the word was out that silver was discovered in the Virginia City area. In 1859, people from the East and the West rushed to Washam to the latest mining boom. By 1861, Myron Lake owned a wooden toll bridge over the Truckee River and a log hotel on the south side of the river. Now Lake had traded his Honey Lake farm for Charles Fuller's bridge and log hotel. He, Fuller had acquired a toll road franchise from the Nevada Territorial Legislature and he had built his inn and tavern around 1859 and 1860 on the south side of the Truckee River on today's Virginia, on what we call today's Virginia Street. Now look at this here, you can see it's very interesting. This sketch, which was later turned into a painting um, 20 years later, um, this sketch shows a lot of wood and we think this is the second building here because there had been a flood in, the, in, a, in a winter that had wiped out the first building. The Truckee River and the, actually the Truckee Meadows was a swampy, sloughy, marshy area and the Truckee River was quite rough and very rocky, very serpentine in its meandering. It had a very strong current. You could cross it by foot, but it was icy cold and very rough. And in the snow melt at times, you could be easily washed away. So a bridge was something that was very much needed. And Charles Fuller saw this and exploited it. But Myron Lake took it over in 1861 and I wanted to comment too that we, there are lots of copies of this picture around. And in fact, it's Cyrene, Cyrene's McLennan who sketched this picture, painted it 20 years ago, Reno 20 years ago. And this um, was commissioned by Myron Lake. And he in fact put himself in the picture with some Native Americans. And the original of this is in the Lake Mansion today. And you can see it there. Um, there is another version where no people are in it, and we have one of those at the Historical Society. The Countryman family, four brothers who moved to the area, there's Horace, um, I think he may have been the dad, Myron, I mean, sorry, Horace, Lewis, Dennis, and Peter, all established homesteads um, and built the English ditch and mill around the uh, Truckee River but they sold out and left in 1865 and ended up in Montana. You can see the Truckee River here and the countryman's properties. Here's Interstate 80 today to give you some perspective. But these people all left before um, um, 1865. People had discussed building a transcontinental railroad for 30 years. And in 1862, Congress authorized a Central Pacific Railroad to build east from Sacramento and the Union Pacific Railway to build west from Omaha to join in Utah. Pushing through the granite mountains of the Sierra took five years of hard work. But by 1868, the track reached Nevada. By this time, Myron Lake owned a lot of land around the bridge. His tolls proved very fruitful. And he helped convince the railroad owners to build a station near his bridge 
by offering land for the station and town. In April 68, the Central Pacific announced the new station and town would be called Reno. General Jesse Lee Reno was a Union soldier who had died. And there are stories that Charles Crocker, brother of Judge Ed Crocker, who was a legal counsel to the Central Pacific Railroad, Charles Crocker was a friend and wanted his, uh, um, this general to be remembered. There was talk of the town being called Argenta after the word silver in Latin, Argentum. But um, Reno won out. In fact, some originally thought it was supposed to be Reno, but we are called Reno today. And uh, in May 1868, they held an auction of lots in the new town. Only 25% were sold, but by June 1868, when about 100 wooden buildings and shacks had been built, here's another very interesting picture. Um, this picture is the oldest known photo that shows anything of the second wooden Virginia Street Bridge. 1868 it was taken. This is the toll collector here. Must have lost a lot of business maybe later on. <laughs> you can see the wooden shacks. Hundreds of, hundreds of lots and hundreds of new wooden buildings. The first track was, had been built and the first train arrived in Reno. And you can see how quickly some of these buildings had came up, had, had came up. Soon the, school, the, soon the town had a newspaper, a real school. This Riverside School was located where the Century Building, Century Movie Theater is downtown today. It also had a new hotel. The Central Pacific continued to build east and reach Promontory Summit, familiarly known as Promontory Point near Promontory, Utah, to meet the Union Pacific in June 1869 and drive in the Golden Spike. Now, freight wagons were a common sight between Reno and Virginia City. It's not um, thought of much, but the Truckee Meadows was an agricultural centre, lots of ranches and farms supplying the mines on the Comstock. Also, freight wagons were very busy coming between Honey Lake and Reno to go to feed the Virginia City miners. These freight wagons were used also to bring ore from the mines to Carson for processing. But in 1870, the first railway line from Virginia City to Carson was built and then by 1872, the line extended to Reno, thus connecting Virginia City to the rest of the world. The trains ran frequently. This is the Crown Point Trestle Bridge, an engineering marvel for its day. It is filled in now, but if you go on the VNT from Virginia City to Gold Hill, you will cross where it's been filled in. The tickets to Reno and Truckee, you can see some of the um, along the Truckee Railway. You can see where a lot of the um, stations were. There was a river crossing downtown here on Peavine Street, which is now Evans Street. There was a water tank and depot on land there, near where is now the Automobile Museum. There was a turning on Virginia Street in Midtown. That's why we have some rather strange configurations in um, along Virginia Street. Maybe there's a roundabout now in Midtown where the trains used to turn around. Also on Holcomb, where the park is, there was a, a train that turned around there as well. And a, a monument you can go and visit today, one of the very famous trains. <laughs> Reno continued to grow. A Masonic building at Commercial and Sierra used to be the oldest building in town until it was torn down early last year. Reno was made the county seat. Here is the commercial row. This is the railway station here see lots of shops along this street. The Washoe County Courthouse built in 1873. This building, believe it or not, is still here with us today. It's contained within the present courthouse. The new Virginia Street Bridge, light and airy. It looks a little similar to the one we have today. 
Here you can see the rocky um, Truckee River, a little bit lower in water. This livery and feed stable here um, it was owned by Thomas K. Hymas, who actually helped build the iron and concrete bridges. He was a very prominent um, politician and businessman in the latter part of the 19th century. A central school was built, a priority in the new town. It was on West Street. East and West Street bordered the eastern and western sides of the town. East Street is now Lake Street today. Note this picture as you will see the, an addition made towards the end of the century. Fire was a major problem in most Western towns built of wood, especially in Reno with its frequent high winds. In 1873, a fire in Reno wiped out 100 buildings and the town quickly rebuilt. In 1879, fire burnt 10 city blocks. The town built with churches like this Catholic church, homes like the lake house, now called the Lake Mansion, a mental asylum, a hotel was moved here, an opera house that was very popular, many businesses, a post office, and an enlarged central school. You can see here the enlargement. In 1886, the Nevada legislature decided to move what is now the University of Nevada in Reno to Reno. Morrill Hall was built to the north of Reno. And for 10 years, it housed the classrooms, the dormitories and the offices of the university. You can see the gates here, which are quite obvious today. You can see these gates up there. The Rose Garden is just over here. Here's Morrill Hall. This is Stewart Hall, named after William Morris Stewart, Nevada's first senator. Um, this building was taken down in 1966. The Mackey family funded much of the development of the camp University of Nevada campus through 1937. Here is a picture of the campus in 1944. You can see the quad here. You can see the um, older sports facilities. And of course, the university has much of this land now. Lawler Events Center is way up here and the Historical Society is off the map. Mining in the Virginia City area played out about 1878. The population of Nevada dropped from 60,000 to 40,000 during this time, dropping mostly in the mining areas. In fact, Nevada almost lost its statehood during this time. The first decade of the 1900s saw the Nevada economy improve through the mining booms in Tonopah and Goldfield, with Reno being the banking center and the major railroad center in the state. Goldfield, as I said, was the largest town outside San Francisco in the West at this time. It was a decade of building in Reno, from a library to a new bridge and Riverside Hotel. This bridge lasted until just a few years ago. Masonic Temple on First and Virginia Street, a federal building, post office, Bell Island for recreation. Bell was named in honor of George Winfield's mother. Coney Island, a remodeled courthouse. And as I told you earlier, this is um, the old courthouse is actually contained within this building because it was much smaller. You can get a glimpse of it if you are lucky enough to go into the number one courthouse and get into the judge's office. <laughs> you can see some of the old bricks or if you go above and you can see maybe a glimpses of the old chimneys. And a view of the modern city of Reno in 1908. And here we have the Truckee River, Bell Island here. Here is the Virginia Street Bridge, the um, Riverside Hotel. We have the um, 
Masonic building here. We have the university buildings way up here on the left. This is possibly the Newlands Mansion. You can maybe see the Catholic Cathedral over here. Ranching was critical to supporting mining and the Reno area. And you might see some familiar names on the ranches. Hay, alfalfa, potatoes, cabbages, hops, onions were important crops in Washoe County. By 1883, Washoe County ranches had apple, peach, pear, plum, cherry, and nectarine orchards. Ranches raised cattle, sheep, and chickens. Here we have Huffaker Ranch. Mr. Huffaker um, actually um, donated land for a school in 1867. And that school, or part of it, is now at Bartley Ranch. Here we have the Peckham family. George Peckham had a prized potato farm. Um, also a family of cycle cyclists, very involved in the Reno wheelmen at the turn of the last century. Um, the Peckham, George Peckham actually went to school in Galena, which was an early mining and mill town. And you can read of his accounts growing up in that area in the 1860s at the Historical Society. And many Italians had ranches in the area. Um, there were a lot of charcoal burners. Um, there's talk of a famous Reno ravioli factory. Um, a lot of hay and alfalfa was grown. Alfalfa is still one of the main crops in Nevada. It's a, a legume, um, puts a lot of nitrogen back into the soil and it survives in um, freezing winters um, so that um, it is still grown um, and very quickly um, it was used for horse fodder in the early development of Reno and the trucking meadows. The Collin Ranch family, Chrissy Collin married Sheriff Anderson, and this home was actually brought from Virginia City, and it is still sitting on Mayberry Lane today. In 1904, Reno had a trolley that went to Sparks and later south to Moana, which was a very popular picnic spot in the summertime, especially for the hot springs. The automobile changed the lives and the economy of the United States and Nevada. In the 1900s, automobiles frequented the streets along with the horse and buggy. Look at this wonderful picture of Center Street. We have the Reno Evening Gazette. We have City Hall, which was built in 1905-1906, and a theatre here, which backs on to the river. <laughs> Didn't like their river in those days. Across the river, we see some trees and a park. The Centre Street Bridge was not built until 1926. The Sierra and Lake Bridges too, I looked up, weren't built until 1936 and 37. So the Virginia Street Bridge was very important as the only way to crossing for many, many years. Automobile dealers appeared in Reno. Still today on the South Virginia Street, just south of the federal building, you can see some of these original buildings where the windows are so, so large that people could test drive their vehicles by just driving out onto the street through the windows. Tires and repair shops came about. Automobiles became essential. Roads and towns were improved to accommodate the automobiles and lots of people enjoyed driving around the countryside. New skills. In 1915, the Lincoln Highway began connecting towns and cities across America, but some roads were pretty basic. Federal monies to improve and build roads in Nevada were a major part of the economy of the state beginning in 1918. The automobile, the mining booms and federal funds changed everything. This is the road towards Mount Rose in the 1940s, a little bit different today. Today, There's a lot of dispute about the name of Mount Rose. Could it be Rose Hickman, a friend of H.C. Ham, a printer for the Washoe Times newspaper? Could it be Jacob H. Rose, an early Frank Tan Mill owner? Could it be that it looks like a rose? That's Carol Rose, Carol Coleman's suggestion. Or could it be that Hank Mumps, Monk, one of the infamous stagecoach drivers in the early days who saw his daughter Rose's image in the mountains? <laughs> we don't know why it's called Mount Rose, but this is Mount Rose here 
and slide mountain over here to the left. The look of downtown certainly changed because of the development of the automobile. Now, quoting a 1934 article in Fortune magazine, Reno lies in Nevada's western corner, 10 miles from California, population 18,500. It was only 1,000 in 1870. Elevation 4,500 feet, reputation bad. Oh dear. As early as 1861, the Nevada Territorial Constitution offered a six month residency and reasonable requirements for divorce. From early 1900, Reno's economy relied on the divorce industry. Reno was known as the divorce capital of the world between 1910 and 1970. By 1910, hundreds were traveling to Reno to establish residency for divorce. Attention was drawn to Reno with the divorce of famous people. The several thousand people who came to the state annually to obtain divorces left substantially sums of money, materially easing the effects of the depression. In 1927, divorce residency was lowered to three months. And in 1931, it was lowered to six weeks. During the 1930s, more than 30,000 divorces were granted at the Washoe County Courthouse. Reno um, accommodated its visitors by building dude ranches, boarding houses, alley homes, for which the city had to change its laws and, hotel and also hotels were built. The Golden, the rebuilt glamorous Riverside, and the El Cortez hotels were all built for the divorce trade. Nevada was also built, building a reputation as a marriage center. The Hitching Post and the Sunset Chapels were among those that operated near the courthouse, the bus station and casino. Divorces arri divorcees arrived in Reno by bus, by train, by car and by plane. One of our other sins was prostitution. In 1937, a law was enacted to require weekly health checks of all prostitutes. In 1942, Franklin D. Roosevelt issued an order to suppress prostitution near military bases, affecting the red light districts of Reno and Las Vegas. Washoe County bans prostitution and brothels, as do Clark, Douglas and Lincoln counties. The famed Mustang Ranch is in Story County, only 30 miles from Reno. While prostitution is not licensed in Nevada, in 1971, the state passed a law allowing legal brothels in cities under 400,000. Each county can decide whether or not to allow brothels. Alcohol was considered a major problem in the United States in the early 1900s. In Reno, women, the university and the churches were the drivers for prohibition. In 1920, the prohibition laws were instituted. Liquor didn't disappear. It was behind closed doors, made at home, made in stills, given through doctor's prescriptions. Prohibition officially ended in 1933, as every state had to vote to ratify it. Gaming was a Nevada institution. By 1910, with the push by the Women's Temperance Union, the university and the churches, gambling was declared illegal in Nevada. But gambling didn't really disappear. It went upstairs, downstairs, behind closed doors. Gambling became legal again in 1931. In 1935, a new type of gambling club opened in Reno called Harold's Club. They advertised something that gaming establishments hadn't done prior, fearful that they would be shut down. Harold's advertised worldwide, but advertised fun, not gambling. Harris began by offering bingo, but became a classy casino with gambling and entertainment. North Virginia Street was the site of many gaming establishments. 
the makes, and here you can see it beginning to be constructed here. Here's North Virginia Street. A hotel casino with top line entertainment opened in 1940 centre, seven kitty cornered across the road from the um, riverside. And here's what a postcard tells me about the mates in 1947. Reno's largest hotel, the Mates, was located in the center of downtown Reno. 300 first-class individually air-conditioned rooms give visitors a wonderful panorama of the Truckee River, which courses beside the hotel, and of the magnificent Sierra Nevada mountains. Top flight entertainment is offered nightly in the casino showroom of the hotel. Showroom, I think it says. Excellent cuisine is found in the coach room restaurant. Um, most of the gaming was first on Douglas Alley, which is parallel to Commercial Row. And many of the casinos used the motels on the Highway 40 for their accommodation. The Mapes was one of the first places where you could actually stay at a casino. Despite being known as Sin City, Reno was a great place to live. The population continued to grow. Businesses expanded. Here's the post office, the new Art Deco post office built in 1934, still currently in business, and not as a post office though. And the Mizpah Hotel built on Lake Street. Um, that was the area that was always for minority groups from Chinese, originally Chinatown over that side of the river. East Street was the border area. Chinatown was burnt down by the city in 1908. Um, Italians, the Basque, all live on that side of the city. And this was the Mizpah here in 1930. Model Dairy, original business. Nevada was tax friendly. No retail sales tax, no corporation tax, no state income tax, no inheritance tax, no tax at all, no thumb tax even. It was the largest city in the state of Nevada through the early 1950s. And thank you to everybody on this list. And my thanks go out to perhaps people, that, especially Sharon, Sharon Honey Bear, as I've learned a lot from her and Jack Harpster's book, the, Gen the Genesis of Reno. And here we have downtown Reno as it is today. And you can see Myron Lakes area and the countrymen's lots here. And uh, we have grown considerably. So thank you. I shall open it up for questions. A wonderful talk, Linda. Let's <laughs> see, I see a couple questions. This one is a remembrance, uh, but, a, but a question. It's, I remember when there were still train tracks embedded in Holcomb through Midtown. They were there at least until the mid nineties. Do you know when they stopped being used? Mm. No, I don't know that. No, it's the well, 1990s. They weren't used after the 50s. No. The railway stopped, I think, early 50s, wasn't it? 1952 or something. Yes. Well, I, I saw somewhat of a trestle once uh, visit the steam steamboat place down south of um, 431. And they, there's a trestle out behind that place that they say was the V&T track. Uh -huh. And there you can see it. Yeah. Uh, another one, um, do you know how big Virginia City was at its peak? Well, we have a map at the Historical Society with 25,000 people, one of the original maps up there, a copy of it anyway. And it says there were 25,000 people at one time, yes. And so after like 1878, they well, no, that, that was in decline by 1878. In the mid-1860s, that, that was one peak, and then in the mid-1870s was another peak. Okay. So, yes. I haven't got my memory from that map to see when it was actually illustrate, or illustrative of the 25,000, so I'm sorry, but it might have been around 1872, possibly. Uh, what was the government of Nevada when it was a territory you mentioned a Nevada Territory Legislature. Yes, that was when Mark Twain came out here first because his brother was secretary to um, 
the go to the um, governor. It was Nye, wasn't it? I don't remember. <laughs> no, eighteen sixty-two. Actually, I should look it up, but I think it was because the territorial. It was a territory from eighteen sixty-one, two, and three until eighty-four. Yeah. So let me just during that time they wrote a constitution, or they had one already. In no, they had to write it. But when was when was that done? In in eighteen sixty four, all the prior because it was October, so they would have been writing it. And as as Lorraine said this morning, Nye had his hand in it, so they had prominent lawyers and they had people from California doing it. Okay. Politicians. Mm. So was Utah still governing then? Uh, after eighteen sixty one or. No, because we were a territory, so we had our own own people, I think, okay. with the governor there. If Nevada had no taxes, how did the state state make money? <laughs> you know, on that in that advertisement, that's a good question. No thumb tax, no income tax. Well, it taxed, but it made revenue from the casino, so it must have had the same sales tax like it does today. And. Now, was property tax allowed? Yeah, there? they must have had property tax. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And certainly they were taxing the mining mines. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mine Very mines. limited, though, like the Stewart mining oh, tax. Yeah. yeah. Actually, the Stewart law, which is the mining tax, was there were the miners who were very much in favour of that limited tax rate that the Stewart mining law encompassed because they wanted the work and they wanted their jobs protected, and that's why the mining interests were so prominent in getting that tax law made. <laughs> uh, when did Harold's Club get closed down or? In the 80s, late, yeah. late 80s, around 1990 sometime. I think I heard that the Smiths sold out shortly after 1970. Mm -hmm. So another group was running it for a while. Okay. Yes, yeah. Um, what happened to the mitzvah? It got burnt down very tragically. People, it was used as a boarding house and um, it was an ass, a, a, a fire. It didn't have any sprinklers. So a lot of people lost their lives who were living in it. There's a memorial park to it um, on the street. As you go to the greater field, baseball field, you can see it there. Okay. Um, how many acres did Myron Lake give or sell to the railroad to get them to lo locate Reno by his bridge? Um, I, we were discussing that and I think that there's a lot of talk about how many acres he owned in um, Harpster's book on the genesis of Reno and it's I think he had several he had a hundred or so plus acres no more than 160 acres but he didn't give the railroad all his land obviously. It was well, only some map that you referred to with the countrymen's? Yes. Could you go back one slide and, and let's look at that? That was my question and I think it's a real interesting point. So Myron Lake had this brown uh, homestead and the estimate of that acreage is 137.28 acres. Right. The land he gave was the land above the river. Yes. Uh, plus, he, he kept, yeah. I can't quite tell where Virginia Street is, but he kept uh, the, a little bit on the north side of the river by the bridge. So he owned all four corners of the bridge, like the land that abuts the bridge. Yeah. So it was something under 137, perhaps something under 110. Uh, yeah. He actually. Um, this is Virginia Street here. Okay. And then this is Commercial Row here. So this is where the railroad was. Right. So it's everything obvious. above the bridge, the water, the river. Right. The ground was what he gave to be the early, the, or not gave. He either got paid or he traded or something. Yeah. yeah. So that, that was what he, uh, port, the parcel that he gave to the mm -hmm. note. Okay, let's see. Um, I saw one more. 
uh, Lorraine asks, and this, <laughs> I don't think either one of us can answer. Does NHS have info on the people that take the photos? They took the photos. Yes, sometimes they do because they're collections, yeah. but sometimes they don't because I have several copies of the pictures and they don't um, have very mu much information because um, it depends. Well, they have the information, they have the accession record. So sometimes, yes, Lorraine, you know this, <laughs> that they, the, some of the details are sketchy and some they know, they, they know exactly who donated the material. So whether it comes from someone's scrapbook or family memento, but they don't often give you the details on the photo itself because this is the oldest known photograph taken off Virginia City in 1862. It's a July 4th parade. And it has no source of information on it, but it does have an accession number. So if I wanted to, I could perhaps track it down. And they do have, I remember Lee Brumbar, our curator back of the photographs. He always knew if it was taken by a famous photo photographer or someone in town like Jerry Fenwick or Neil Cobb's family. And so they do know some of those pictures. Yes. Yeah. No. Uh, William Cann took a lot of pictures. Yes, he does too. I sold, sold them out of his uh, um, pharmacy uh, as postcards. Yeah. And he had a very specific signature he put on the front of those photos. So those you can certainly tell. Okay, I think that ends our questions. And I thank you, Linda. Uh, thanks to all of you for attending today's final session of our Washoe County Library and the Nevada Historical Society collaboration for our town. The Nevada Historical Society Museum and Research Library are open on a limited schedule now. Uh, please check our website for details. Uh, we hope to record your COVID-19 stories for posterity. Either mail our director and you'll see her email on the slide or send it, uh, send it by U.S. mail, you see our address. Uh, and you, I don't know if there's a way to send them on the website, but it's worth checking. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Carol. Thank you everyone for attending this talk today. We've enjoyed spending the afternoon with you for these uh, lectures. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.